Wow. Two more weeks after this. Don't remind me. I know. You know, it's um I always feel at the end of toward the end of a semester like, oh, I just didn't cover enough. So that's where I always feel. Very well. Well, thank you. That's very that's very thoughtful. Listen, what we're gonna do tonight is gears and um I have cams on the schedule. And one problem with the cam project, and the more I think about it, the more I realize it is really difficult to create a cam in SolidWorks. It is really easy to create a cam in AutoCAD. Most of you don't know how to use AutoCAD though. So it's not gonna be one of those things where I can have you do it. So I think what I'm gonna do next time, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to eliminate the assignment, but still do the presentation. Is that okay with everybody? I want you to understand something about the gear design. The reason I say it's difficult in SolidWorks, SolidWorks is not a good two-dimensional drawing tool. And a gear, I mean, a CAM design, and actually even a gear drawing, I'm gonna give you, a, with the gears, I can have a little workaround, but both gears and CAMs are actually represented with two-dimensional drawing. And then, you know, people don't generally in SolidWorks create an actual gear. If they're gonna represent gears, they represent them schematically, and you'll see that today. Schematically means that there are two-dimensional drawings, and this is something a SolidWorks isn't good at. But I have a trick to make a SolidWorks drawing that is accurate about gears using some dummy gears. And I'll show you that in a minute. And also in some ways it reinforces something that is a little difficult for people to get a handle on sometimes, which is pitch diameter. The cam design is based on something called the displacement diagram, where you literally lay out a two-dimensional diagram that has a baseline representing the circumference that you're using for a pitch diameter. <clears throat> then you actually graph. What do you want to see happen on a cam? And a cam moves things up and down. So you lay it out on a graph. That graph is then used to generate a cam profile. All of it's done in 2D. So the way I can make a cam in SolidWorks, which I've done, is to create it in the AutoCAD or draft site and then copy that, bring it into SolidWorks, and then generate a part from it. So it's one of those things where it'd be really nice if all of you could use both pieces of software but that's just not the case. You know, SolidWorks is really the design software that you're gonna be using in machine tool and any kind of mechanical design. So I am gonna demonstrate it, but I'm not going to require you to do an assignment just because it's so hard to do. So we're gonna jump into gears here, but first I think pretty much everything that has been turned in has been graded. I noticed a few things came in since I graded the other day, pretty much caught up in this class, however, and I will make a point of getting things back to you as quickly as possible for the rest of the semester so you have it in time to make changes if you need to make those changes. We do have a final exam scheduled and that'll happen at the, during the last week. Um, How so, many was that? How many questions? How many questions? It's a bunch. <laughs> it covers everything we've covered so far. So I, how about, I'll just say 50. How's that? That sound all right? Okay, no, it's not gonna be a Brightspace exam. I, I've tried using Brightspace for exams you know, I basically have given up. <clears throat> um, theoretically, they improved something that was a big mess last year, but I just don't have time to become an expert at Brightspace every time I turn around. So rather than try to figure out a way to do something and then discover it didn't work, I'm simply gonna give you the exam, let you do it in a period of time. I'll probably post at the beginning of the week and then have you submit it by the end of the week. Um, from your point of view, that sounds good, except that if I gave it to you in a two hour block, at least after two hours, you'd be done. <laughs> for some people, they end up spending a lot of time. But the, the key thing here for the final exam is for you to recognize what you've learned, to review things that you may have forgotten, and to get a sense of what, and from my point of view, and at least for machinists, are important concept of mechanical design. You understand that I'm not turning into mechanical engineers. And there's a lot of stuff that I used to think about doing with linkages and all kinds of other designs. But I think what we've done, what this class does is really the right thing to do. So, yes, so I have a question. We're not going to do the CAM assignment. When does our, I can probably give you the date, but can we open Mackie's the final be open early or late? Uh, Assignment the question um, that was just asked by a student in this vast classroom full of people that I have, that would be, let me think, it would be, um, I've forgotten his name. This oh, Hunter. 
asked a question. Hunter asked, would it be possible to open the final exam prior to the weekend before the end of the semester since we don't have a CAM? I'll tell you what, why don't I just make the final exam our last assignment? Is that what I'm thinking? That's kind of what Hunter's thinking. I don't know, you know, you think I should just ha hire Hunter to give me advice when I, in all my classes from now on? I, I don't know. What a regret. <laughs> then what the problem is, he would think, oh, that makes me a consultant. Consultants make a lot of money. I heard a joke about consultants. A consultant is somebody you hire to tell you what time it is. He borrows your watch tells you what time it is and keeps the watch. <laughs> but as somebody who has worked as a consultant in the past, that's you know a little offensive, but all right. So I'm gonna jump in. Any, any questions? Anybody have any questions? I'll, I, uh, I will go ahead and do that. All right. So we'll make the final exam. That's actually not a bad idea. Priya, I like that. So no time at time deadline. You just do a really, really good job. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll still make it, yeah, I'll still make it a, um, you know, it's going to be a bigger percentage of your grade than all your other projects. So it's still going to be significant. And that's, you know, your incentive to really go back and, and fix up anything that you might have had problems with before. All right. No questions. I'm going to share my screen. All right. We are. Oh, wait a minute. I have to move around things here. Sorry, folks. I have to unshare my screen because of the overhead projector in here. It doesn't project the same screen that I was thinking it did. And we'll leave that one right there. You had to get all the screens just for it out. So they didn't bring everyone back in person. Well, you know what happens. I had this all set up one time and then somebody came in and didn't like it and changed the monitors around. And it's just one of those weird things. All right. You should be um, looking at our homepage right now. Everybody see the homepage? Okay, good. Let me just make you a little bit bigger here. All right, so um, one, I will not have an open session on Monday. Um, it hasn't been all that well attended anyway, but I'm on the um, interviewing committee for the new plumbing instructor. So I'm gonna be giving, I'm gonna be at interviews. And I really wanted to be involved with that because um, one, in our department, I'm the one who knows most about plumbing, but I also really, um, really am committed to the occupational programs here. And if there's anything I can do to support them, I wanna do it. And that was the only time we could schedule them. I will be here um, Our normal open schedule. Our normal open, that's, uh, that's the wrong one. Oh, that's, that's, that's the normal open schedule for the uh, other class that I was canceling. And I just copied it. So our normal Opal open schedule of 1.30, 1.30 is canceled for next week. But I have another uh, the session that happened just before this class, and I've got other sessions. If you need something, send me an email. You know, then you need to just go ahead. I, didn't, I haven't been able to make those sessions set up last week. Though. I know, I know. Uh, but, you know, if you have a question, something comes up, send me an email. I can figure something out. Um, all right. So what we're doing right now is under assignments, we're doing the gear assignment. And I've got a number of documents there for you. And once again, I put together a PowerPoint with the intent that it'd be something you could use as a reference that you can hang on to. It's a little briefer than some of my other PowerPoints, but it still has that purpose. So when you look at the number of things here, there's a chapter from an engineering textbook that I about gears that I included as reference material for you. There's a handout that includes all the key pieces that you're gonna need to do the assignment. I've got a PowerPoint called Power Transmission. That's what we're gonna open up now. And then I've got an uh, AutoCAD file and a SOLIDWORKS file that are templates that I'm going to have you use to create the assignment. So you can start there, and mostly because they've got a table in them, and I want you to use that table to do something called a gear cutting table. So let's, and I'm going to, I'm sort of assuming that people aren't familiar much with gears. You know, it's not the kind of thing that people normally know a lot about. <clears throat> so what I really, really want to do is go kind of back to basics. So you have this, this uh, PowerPoint right here power transmission and I put this together actually last semester to give you something that you could use as a reference. And we're gonna start by going back a little bit and talk about gears of power transmitters, which is what they are. There are a number of ways to transmit power and I'm sure you're familiar with many of them. If you own a car and ever opened the hood, 
unless of course it's an electric car, in which case it doesn't have any of these things. But um, if, although it does have gears, if you open the hood of your car, you look down and, and very often there's this belt down there that you can see. And one of them, for a while, they had serpentine belts. And if you looked in the 60s at the Cadillac, there were belts everywhere. They were just flying all over the place. Um, and when, when you had to replace one of them, it was a nightmare. And part of the thing is you have to go in and go, where did this thing used to go <laughs> if it actually breaks? But, the, the, but belts are really, really effective at transmitting power, and they've got their advantages, but they've also got their disadvantages. And so of the three methods we're going to just look at briefly, you have belts, you have chains slash sprockets, and you have gears. Each one of them has an advantage over the others, and depending on your application, each one of them is useful to you. Belts generally are quieter than um, any other system, and they, they absorb shock. And so they're very, very good at getting shock loaded without giving you a jolt of some kind. And that's one of the reasons why they use in automobiles for things like water pumps, because it, it makes the water pump last longer. You don't have a jolt when it goes in. Yes? Well, there, there is a sort of safety built in. It's almost like a sacrificial, you know, wow. almost like a shear pin or something like that. And Hunter was saying, in some cases, they're designed to break on purpose. I mean, not exactly break on purpose, but before you damage something, a belt will normally well, break. It absorbs the shock, so you start the car, shut it. Turn it yeah, although your car, of course, has gears and you start at the, the starter motor, but... Uh, anyway, the other thing about it is, I mean, I said a serpentine belt, if you'd ever looked at under those, and, and some cars still have them, you can have incredibly complex gear trains. And I shouldn't say gear trains, but drive trains. They're also really cheap. <clears throat> they're much cheaper than gears are, and they're much cheaper than sprockets and chains. The other thing about them, they're easily adjustable. Um, if you just move the things further apart, they tighten up. You move them closer together and they loosen up. You can't do that with gears. You move the gears further apart, they don't work closer together, they don't work. So belts are really um, adaptable and much, much, much more, more easily um, adjusted. One of the problems with gears is, generally speaking, when you're using them, you don't have indexing available to you. What I mean by indexing is this. If you look at this drive system right here, those are, those, that's a flat belt, and those are flat belt pulleys. Well, they can slip, which means we never know exactly what position the two pulleys are referencing each other. You know, if you say, well, this one has to turn at the same time this one does, forget it. That's not what belts do unless they have teeth in them. Timing belts on cars used to be timing chains. Some cars still are timing chains. Timing chains were extremely durable, um, but they were noisy. And they also, on occasion, they, over time, would have a little teeny bit of stretch to them. So there were times when you had to change timing chains. Very seldom, though. Generally speaking, timing chains worked and worked and worked, and that was one of the few, one of the last things that would break in your engine. Timing belts for a period of time had a real crisis, especially with Hondas, because if they broke, it would destroy the engine. Um, it was like, who came up with that, you know? And um, but, but the only way a timing belt works is this: because it's called timing, it has to index. That means as it turns. It has to sequence the opening and closing of valves. And so the only way that could work is if it had teeth in it because you have to eliminate the slip. That all makes sense, everybody? Timing belts are not, you, I don't believe anybody, Subaru and Honda both had vehicles that if the timing belt broke, you ended up losing your engine, which meant that the standard maintenance after a certain number of miles, and I believe on some of the Hondas, it was 50,000. You'd replace the timing belt. And that was not normally something that you could do in your driveway, although people did. Um, so the thing about the belts, there are flat belts and there, there are um, teeth, uh, toothed belts, but there are also V belts. And V belts are the ones that you can really put some force behind. So this is the top end of a drill press. And one of the ways that you, which you transfer power with a belt is you use step pulleys and the step pulleys are going opposite directions. And we're going to talk about gear ratios, and it's really the same thing. If you have a step pulley that's this size and another one that's twice as big, as one turns a full turn, the other one turns a half turn. That means that the speed of the two is different. It's a one to two ratio in the speed. So in the old drill presses, and I believe you still got one in the machine shop that, that's designed like this, you would take the belts, and if you put the, the uh, drive belt on the biggest pulley, 
and you put the driven belt on the smallest pulley, this thing would be turning and the, and the drill press would be turning up really fast. Go the opposite way and the drill press would be turning up fairly slow. We had a couple of milling machines in my high school that were still belt. Belt driven milling machines? Well, most of them are. Yeah. The majority of the milling machines are Lancer gear driven. Yeah. But the milling machines were, we had a couple that were in my high school that were just belt on. Yeah. Yeah, and you, well, and, you know, I had a project one time when I taught industrial arts where you're honing out small engines, and the student who set it up went, oh, I think I have to fix this, and he just got it backwards, mm -hmm. so he put the belt on so that the drill, I mean, a hone is something you put in a drill press, and it's got three stones on it, and you run it up and down inside a cylinder, he put it on the fastest speed, and it was the only accident as an industrial arts teacher I ever had, that thing flew out of the drill press because it was just going way too fast, Somebody, a, a student ducked, went past her and hit another student in the hand. That was my only injury the whole time I was teaching and it was a drill press injury. Um, but that was because he just got it backwards, you know? And um, anyway, that's the way it goes. The other thing about belts is that you can change the direction by just crossing them. And that was traditionally what would happen. I think I've mentioned that at one time, large industrial buildings had a big, set of pulleys that went right down the middle of the of the ceiling with great big and sometimes small flat pulleys on them and a flat belt that was made out of leather would come down and the machines that you were operating would be under one of those and would come down and you basically is a big long power takeoff you have a single source of power that used to be water then it became an electrical motor and that just turned all the time and all the work you did here had to do with, did you tighten the belt? Did you not tighten the belt? Did you twist it? Did you not twist it? Which directions are going in? How fast is it going? And you just had a couple of, a bunch of choices over you when you did that. If you ever go to uh, Callus, go to the raised mustard factory, you'll see a setup that's just like that. It's quite cool. Yeah, there are some, the old textile mills would also run that. Anything that had water as its source, that was usually how it did it. Um, <clears throat> so, now we get down to chains and sprockets and there's, you know, chains and sprockets are used on bicycles are also used. And again, I told you that, that timing chains were normally used at one time. Um, you know, I did a lot of work in a chemical factory and, and when I was a maintenance mechanic and we had a lot of chain driven stuff and the chain driven stuff um, had a couple of characteristics. One is you could adjust them as well to some extent as far as tension goes. But if you really needed to move things, you had to add links to the chains. And there's ways to do that, adding links to the chain. Otherwise, you have some kind of a follower. So if you look at your standard bicycle, and I'm assuming you all rode a bike at one time, true? Everybody's ridden, yeah? You know? So you got this bunch of sprockets back here, and you got a few sprockets up here. And then this whole system right here called the derailleur is spring-loaded, and the idea is to take up any slack in the chain. But a chain is interesting. Unlike um, belts, the chains are only having tension on one side. In other words, you're pulling here, the bottom doesn't have tension on it. So you just need to get the slack out of the way. What's that? That's how you're able to kick it by accident. And then yeah. Um, now that's not necessarily true of all chain drives. Some chain drives don't have that kind of mechanism, that kind of, um, you know, this, uh, to take up the slack mechanism. But if you remember your bicycle, this is all that gear, gear ratios are about. Right now, if you take a look at this, the front sprocket, there's only two on this bike. The front sprocket is what's engaged right now with that chain. The largest sprocket in the rear. This is when you have the easiest job pedaling. Because if you go around once with this, it, well, this is a part of one to two, but then this goes around twice. If you flip it, where you put the chain on the big one, and then you put the back chain on the little one, there might be a one to five ratio. That means every time that sprocket goes around once, this one goes around five times. So when you're riding your bike, if you recall, you start in a low gear. That means a little sprocket in the front and a big sprocket in the back. And after a while, you're going, man, I cannot keep up with this bike. I just can barely do it. And you shift up and you shift up and you shift up. If when you jump on your bike, it's already in high gear, good luck getting it started, right? So that's familiar to everybody, correct? That's the concept of gear ratio. And a small gear driving a large gear gives you power, and a large gear driving a small gear gives you speed. So you know, when you are driving around in your four-wheeler and you decide to put it in the crawl mode, where you're going to crawl up a hill, 
you've got a very, very small gear driving a very, very big gear so that you don't, don't move very fast, but you've got a lot of power behind it. That all makes sense? Chains have a real advantage over most belts in that you can index them really well, and that's the timing chain. Now, I used to have in this presentation that chains are noisy. <clears throat> then I discovered that the car that I had purchased in 2004, which was the first Prius in Maine, well, the first second generation Prius, is chain driven, which just surprised me because it was a very quiet car. But the final power transmission on that car was chain based. So it's possible if you design a chain well enough to make them quite quiet. So, yes. Unless it's really worn down, chains don't have slippage. They don't, well, they actually even then don't have slippage, but they can stretch. Um, it's funny, my wife is not very big and um, she's not what you'd call powerful athlete. But when she first rode a bicycle, she didn't like to shift. So she was always in a high gear. And one time she started having problems with the chain and so, I would took it out and it just didn't wrap very well. And I took it off. She had stretched that chain almost a whole link. So it never wrapped anywhere because she didn't want to shift down. So she just stand up and just grind away, you know? So chains can stretch, there's no question about it. My chain, however, in my 18 speed gear that I had set up specifically with a, it's called a step and a half granny, no stretch at all because I was always in the right gear. Of course you had high-end technology i did i did i love my bike i still like this bike I, I have a bike i bought that was handmade so many years ago it was stunning how much i paid for it but uh still a great bike and you know the thing about people upgrade their bikes a lot i have upgraded some components but i think i'm gonna die this will be the only bike i have when i'm when i finally go all right I said, I think I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die. And, and I don't mean to surprise any of you, but so are all of you. But if that's, you know, that I just, I, that was a trigger event, wasn't it? I shouldn't have said that. You guys probably all go complain. And... Yeah, I could be living talking relaxing over here and sitting forever. <laughs> Gears are where we're headed here. There's a relationship among all these things. One is that they transmit power, but the other is a concept of gear ratio. It doesn't just apply to gears. That's what we're looking at with sprockets or, or um, pulleys. So, but gears are really complex and there's a ton of different kinds of gears. The, chance, the, the, base, the thing is, the main thing of their advantage, they're much stronger than any other system. They're also more compact. You put together a gearbox and you can see right here, that is one compact gearbox right there. And those gears, they slide back and forth. They engage each other in different ways. And that's, a, um, that's what a, a lot of modern manual transmission gearboxes look like. Although I don't know how many manual transmission gearboxes there are anymore. I have a young friend who um, was over the other day and he bought his girlfriend's car from her and it's a six speed manual transmission. And I said, I've got to drive this car. <laughs> it's been so long since I've driven a manual transmission car. We just got to go and do it. They are very hard to adjust. In other words, when you're manufacturing these or your machine is, they better be on the money. You just can't go, oh, they're a little too close together. You just need to have, and I'll show you in a minute why that is. What's really critical is a center to center distance between two gears. And we're going to look at spur gears only. We're not going to deal with helical gears. We're not going to deal with those because the complexities there are just a little too great. But that is a range or that is a collection of the kinds of gears we're talking about. And we're also going to throw rack and pinion in there as well. So far, so good, folks. OK, now let's take a look at the different types, the basic different types of gears. A spur gear is that traditional gear that is looks like this, has teeth in it. You engage with another gear. And, the, and when you use these, the forces are parallel. In other words, the axes of spear gear, spur gears are parallel to each other. You can't turn any corners. You know, you can't do anything that's offset. You have to have the two things lined right up. We're gonna, that's the gear system we're gonna look at right now. The gear tooth is a very complex convolute involute shape. And I'm gonna tell you where that shape comes from but I'm gonna also tell you that it's a difficult shape to recreate. And when you cut gears in a machine shop, you generally buy a tool that was designed specifically to cut that gear tooth shape in. Bevel gears are interesting because they allow you to turn the force 90 degrees. So if you have a differential in your car and you have motion like this going to the back wheels, well, your back wheels don't run that way. 
right? Your back wheels run 90 degrees to that. A differential gear is literally a bevel set of bevel gears in that differential um, housing that take the, whatever the power is that's coming in and then turn it 90 degrees so it can go to the wheel. Those are still the same shape tooth, generally. They're still involute tooth. Helical gears are really interesting. They, um, the force can be either way, and they're literally a tooth that has a helix in them. And if you've ever cut one on a, on a milling machine, it's this fun kind of thing to do because what you have to do is set up your milling machine so you clamp the, the blank that you're cutting a gear, gear in you, blank, you, you uh, clamp that to something called an indexing head, and then the indexing head has to be connected to the table of the milling machine. So as the milling machine moves, the index head turns so you can get the cutter going, and then you move the blank past that cutter, and it's turning as it moves past, and you end up with a helix. I've, I've never done it. I've seen my father do it, but I only saw him do it a couple of times. It was unusual for us to cut helical gears. But the beauty of helical gears is you can engage them in either direction. They can be parallel or they can be perpendicular. They're also quiet if they're made correctly. Um, they've got some, some um, advantages in terms of strength as well, mostly because they're longer. Make sense? Worm gears are really interesting because a worm gear is the one gear that can only be driven in one direction. Now, if you ever have, you know, they call them craftsman wrenches, but an adjustable wrench, they call them craftsman because Sears was the first one to come up with this thing. And that was many, many years ago. You know, when you adjust your adjustable wrench, <clears throat> you turn a little worm gear. And when you do that like this, it moves the something back and forth. That's actually a rack. But that means turning the worm will move that back and forth. But if moving that back and forth would turn the worm, the wrench wouldn't work, right? You'd stick the wrench on there and it would open up. And you go, oh, that was really worthwhile. So it's really got a purpose. And that purpose is to make sure power can only go in one direction. So if you look at this right now, if you apply force to this gear, there's nothing it's going to do with that except break it. There's no way it can turn that. It's the way it's set up. <clears throat> and if you don't believe me, get, a, get yourself your adjustable wrench, take a look at it, and then try to move the worm by pulling the jaws apart. Pull them as hard as you can. Don't break your adjustable wrench. I broke a 24-inch adjustable wrench one time on a job. I had a 30-foot cheater pipe. And you can, it was, yeah, it was an oil rig. And we had big stuff in that oil rig. And I got a piece of pipe that we normally use for something else. And I got it up in there and jumped up and grabbed it and broke the wrench. Needless to say, I did not get, a, I did not get the thing apart that I wanted to get apart. Believe it or not, we had to get a torch and cut it. So um, <clears throat> rack and pinion, <clears throat> rack and pinion is a system where you're using a gear called a pinion to move something flat back and forth. Um, you know, visually, you can assume, you can imagine what, what used to be called rack and pinion steering. They don't make a big deal about it anymore. But that was always the most responsive steering. And that's what you'd put in cars that were designed to be sports cars or race cars. So the, <clears throat> the rack would connect to the wheels. And you want to move it like this so the wheels do this. You have a pinion going down, and now there's this immediate response. Now a lot of things, a lot of things have changed, including drive-by-wire stuff. We have electronics and things doing stuff. If you had any idea how much your safety in your car dependent upon electronics, <laughs> you might never drive a car again. So, so let's get to the actual power transmission. The gear ratio is the ratio in terms of two different size gears. And this applies to pulleys, this applies to um, uh, sprockets as well. If you have two gears that are the same size, they're moving, they're turning at the same speed. They're applying the same amount of power in both directions. And the only reason to do that is usually because you have one gear running more than one other gear. And so you might have the gears the same size, but this one gear is turning. And at the same time, it is turning several other gears as well. You have something in a gear called gear pitch. And pitch means the same thing here that it does in threads. How frequently does a tooth appear? And just like with a thread, if you have a, um, you know, a 20 pitch thread, and you try to engage it with a 24 pitch thread, it doesn't work. If you haven't done that, you know, if you had a fine thread, you know, take a fine thread and go, well, I don't have a fine thread nut, but I have a, a coarse thread nut. I'm sure I could fit it on there. And yes, you can get it on there and then, yeah, you aren't gonna get it off again. 
<clears throat> same thing is true with gears. If you're going to buy a gear, you have to buy a six pitch gear to engage with another six pitch gear that the gear teeth, the spacing on the gear teeth is based on how frequently they arrive. And that's what the word pitch means. So gears are given um, like are designated as six pitch or five pitch or eight pitch. And what that means is there are six teeth per diametrical inch of gear. <clears throat> the diametrical inch applies to something called a pitch diameter. Now, let me open something up here. I want to make sure I got a little solid work thing here for you. All right, so here's a gear ratio example. There are 20 tweets. Tweets. <laughs> I've got a I've got a, a peanut gallery in here making fun of me. I guess I'm a little tired today. I don't know. <laughs> it appears to me that my my diction is not up to snuff. You know, I've had people on my YouTube channel once in a while. We'll watch a YouTube. And go, oh, this was great. Thank you. But I don't like the way your voice sounds. And I'm like. All right. Well, <laughs> what can I do about it? One guy was so so snarky about it. I said, "Listen, go find someone else's YouTube channel to look at here." And then, anyway, I must I must have done something like what I just did there. So there's 20 teeth in this gear. There are 40 teeth in this gear. They have the same pitch, i.e., the teeth are identical and they're spaced identically. And you can see why. If they weren't, when you did this, at some point they wouldn't engage anymore. Right now, there's also something called a, uh, a an angle, a pitch angle, um, and a pressure angle. I'm sorry, pressure angle is a little different. It's not the pitch, and it's possible to get two gears to engage with different pressure angles. It's just a big a big mistake to do it, mostly because of damage. So what happens is this: as I turn this right here, one, you'll notice that when you have gears, the other one goes in the opposite direction. Everybody see that? There's no twisting the belts on this one. You want two gears to go in the same direction? Well, put one on the other side. You know, you can go from here to here to another one. So two gears, if there's an even number of gears in a gear train, the last gear in that train is going to go in the opposite direction of the first gear in that train. But as I turn this, if I take, and you can see I put a um, keyway in these. So if I turn this thing and it goes around, Come on, go around. As it goes around, if this little one goes around once, this one goes around half a turn. That makes sense, everybody? And that's the re relationship with the speed. So the ratio, the gear ratio here is a ratio between the number of teeth, in other words, 20 to 40, that's one to two, the pitch diameters, this pitch diameter is half as much as that one, one to two, and you could, there's a couple other things that happen to follow along as well. But the two key things are what are the pitch diameters and how many teeth are there? If you know that, you know the gear ratio of a gear system. Uh, and, yeah, and then in terms of speed, if you're driving the small one with the big one, this goes around one time and the little one goes around twice. So the little one's going twice as fast as the big one. And there's your gear ratio. Power, you want really, you want to do some work here, you do this. And the smaller that gear is, the more work it's going to do as far as transferring it to the other one. So is this small one, come on, solid work. What are you doing to me here? Well, for some reason, I didn't lock it. Here we go. Here we go. As the small one turns and turns the big one, you're transmitting more power. So you get twice as much power out of the right one as you're putting in from the left one. Now, power is a measure of work. And if you've ever taken physics, and I hope you all have, and I hope you all loved it because it's a wonderful science, you know that you can't get more work out of a system than you put in. And the, re the relationship is distance and force. So you can increase the amount of distance and decrease the amount of force. You can decrease the amount of distance and increase the amount of force. So the distance that this travels is bigger than the distance this does which is why you get the same amount of work, but that's more force. So the power, in fact, is the same because in both cases, you're moving the same distance and you're moving the same distance and getting the same force, uh, same power, but this one has more force because it's only moving half as far. So you multiply those two things together, that's power. And that's also why, you know, if you have a big long ramp and you're pushing something up, the ratio of that ramp allows you to say, this isn't hard to do at all, but when you're done, you've got something that's up in the air that far. 
if you stood there and picked it up in the air and set it down, it would take a lot more force because you're moving a shorter distance than you are over a ramp. Um, that's the reason why my cheater pipe worked. I had a long, long lever, right? But a long, long lever, well, that distance, you have to move it is a long, long distance at the end, you get a way, way more force. So when you open a paint can and you get the screwdriver out, it's because you're moving the end of that screwdriver so much further than that little part you put into the can at the top. Make sense, folks? Physics, you gotta love it. So now let's, how are we doing on time? Good. Now let's go back to, whoop. Where's my... Oh, here we go. Um, so now we're going to talk about pitch diameter, dedendum, and addendum. And you're going to do some calculations for me on this one. But that just means, and this is no scarier than doing classes of fit. You're going to look at a table. You're going to do some math based on that table. But what you have to understand is what are dedendums and addendums. So I'm going to go back to the actual gear train that I had here. Make it nice and big. I'm going to zoom right in here. You'll notice that as these gear teeth engage, there's a little gap right there. But you see that? There's also a little gap right here. If there weren't a gap, this gear would wear out in a hurry and it'd be really, really noisy. The side of it, and you can't tell that here because the resolution of the monitor is such that it looks like it's got flat surfaces. That's a nice, smooth curve. And, oh, I forgot to bring, well, I'll describe here what an involute curve is just to give you a visual idea. It's not an arc. It is a curve with a continuously changing radius. So it's not a single arc because no matter where you are on that, the radius is different at any given point. And here's how to visualize it. Suppose you took a can cylinder and you wrapped string around it and you held the string out at the side and you put a pen in that string and you put tension on the string and you started moving the string to unwind it from the can. And as you unwind it, the string gets further and further away. If you're drawing something at the same time, you are creating an involute curve. So it's a specific kind of curve. And the reason you use it in gear teeth is so that when the gear teeth engage, they engage smoothly, stay in contact throughout the entire length, and then disengage instead of bang. So an involute curve, an involute curve, um, curve is, is really a critical part of a gear tooth. And you can't see that in most gear teeth because the curve is subtle. And when you have a computer, it can't represent it very well. And so it shows that it's flat surface. The pitch diameter is the diameter of the gear that would run not halfway through here. It's actually a little further than halfway between the bottom of the tooth and the top of the tooth, but it's a theoretical size. It's impossible to measure directly because there's nothing there but it represents what these gears would be if you eliminated the teeth, but you still wanted them to work. Now, you're probably thinking that doesn't make any sense and you're sort of half right. Sure. But I'm gonna say, in other words, if your gear train looked like this, you notice how things overlap here? Well, if you took out the teeth and you move these things apart, you would have what's called a pitch diameter. And the pitch diameter would be that line and this line. And you notice how they are now tangent. So if you had two cylinders with no teeth and you push them together so the friction allowed one to turn the other, the size of those two gears would be their pitch diameter. Anybody with me on that? So you'd basically cut the teeth off and then fill in the gap. And the pitch diameter is always a design diameter that you're using to determine the gear you need and also to determine things like um, what the center to center distance is. So right now, this is my trick in SolidWorks to create a gear drawing because what a gear drawing looks like, and this, by the way, is one way the gears go. You can take this, the when I say more compact, you, you're never going to see a gear train like that. This is simply a pedagogical trick. I want you to show me you can draw something and I'm going to give you something to draw. You'd be much more likely to see something like that. 
where the oh. where the gears are. I mean, that's exactly the same gear train, it has exactly the same effect, and that this one drives this one, which also drives this one that drives this one and drives that one. Excuse me. Um, or you could say this one's driving all these others, but it has exactly the same effect as the other one does, but you've moved the gears around. And when I say you can put them in a compact area, that's why. You might want this to happen, or you bring it into a gearbox, and in your gearbox, you have small clearances so gear teeth don't clash, and then gears can drive other gears, and it goes all over the place. And that really is what I showed you back here. Isn't that different ratios? They're all different ratios. No, but I'm saying... Like you can't take that little one and put it like on that other medium sized one and say that's the exact same thing, right? Like no, 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 no. What the relationship here is always the relationship between this one and this one, this turning that one, this turning this one. And you notice this is the drive gear right here, turning two different gears, each of which is turning another gear. But if I go back to the, uh, the gear train I just showed you, that brings up something. Okay. No, I didn't see that at first. I thought they were different colors. Yeah. Okay, that's so in other words, that's this one right here, right? So that little one right there, if you were turning that, it would turn this one, which would turn this one. It would turn this one, which would turn this one. If you started here and went to here, but here's the thing. What is the gear ratio? It's based on the pitch diameter. If this gear and the final gear have the same pitch diameter, they're turning at the same speed no matter how many gears go in between. No matter the differences or anything. It, no, I can't, I cannot. And we can look, go back and I can trace that out. What I'm gonna have you do when you do this, you're gonna calculate for each one of the gears in the, in the gear train that you designed. Well, you're not designing it, I'm giving it to you, but you're gonna draw. I'm then gonna have you tell me, which direction does this turn? Clockwise, what direction does this turn? Counterclockwise. Um, what's the speed of this? What's the speed of this? When you go and do the math and you do it out to enough decimal places so you don't have a rounding error, the ratio between this one and this one, then this one and this one, then this one and this one, and then this one and this one is going to result in this turning at the same speed as though it were engaged directly with that first gear. So in any gear system, if there's two gears in that system with 20 teeth, they're turning at the same speed. Everybody with me on that one? Um, and we can prove that if you want, but it was, but for now, uh, but you're going to prove it when you do the assignment. Well, you're going to have frictional losses to some extent, but those frictional losses are going to result in the power that you put in is going to be diminished somewhat by those frictional losses as it gets turned into heat. As far as the speed goes, no, there will be none. The question here, folks, was, well, wait a minute, though. You're going through here. Isn't there going to be some loss in that whole system? When you think of loss when you're talking about work, you're saying, listen, I got a certain amount of power going into this system and a certain amount of power coming out. Gee, the same amount going in didn't come out. What happened? It created some heat. So some of that power was used up by doing this, right? You do that with your hands and all that force you're putting on, some of that power is turning into heat and that heat is no longer useful. What's the big problem with internal combustion engines? 30% of the power goes out the exhaust as heat. I don't know if it's 30% anymore, but it's you know, some large amount. That's getting better and better. And internal combustion engines are getting more and more efficient. Automobile internal combustion engines. Lawnmowers are still horribly inefficient and horribly polluting. If you were thinking, <clears throat> gee, <clears throat> I like that idea that Dan had to get an electric car. That'll reduce the amount of pollution I put into the air. You're better off getting an electric lawnmower first. You're going to save more power. Or you can do what I do. I have five electric lawn appliances and an electric car. So, you know, you can be a complete nut if you want. Feel free. I think my uh, backpack will outrun your uh, battery leak for you think you're what? I don't have an electric leaf blower, but I'll put my electric um, lawnmower up against anybody's lawnmower. I'll tell you what, I have an electric chainsaw. I grew up on a farm, folks. I've used a chainsaw a lot. I have never used a chainsaw that was better than this one because electric motors have instant torque, high torque. This, and it, not only that, but my neighbor borrows it. And I love it because it's so much quieter than the one he used to use. <laughs> so if he's my neighbor, I want it to be as quiet as possible. All right, let's get moving here. 
So this is really not a serious system because it's got overlap, but what is the purpose of it? When you're all done with a drawing, so let me go back here. When you're all done with a gear drawing, it's gonna look like this. This is what a, this is what a gear drawing looks like. No, no, the color I put in there because it's hard to differentiate. I'm just a really nice guy and I wanted you to not squint too much when you looked at it. So, but there is a, a line type issue with a drawing. So now we're, we're talking technical graphics now. I'm representing gears. Do you feel like drawing gear teeth when you do that? You do not. <laughs> you also don't want to do that in a, in a SOLIDWORKS drawing. So a gear drawing looks like that. You show anything that has to be made, i.e. the hub and the hole, but the gear teeth are represented schematically and they're represented with three circles. Two of them are phantom lines and one of them is a center line. The center line is the one that's red and that's the pitch diameter. And so the pitch diameter in this case on a 40 tooth gear in this particular type of gear, the pitch diameter is 10 inches. So as a 10 inch gear, it has 40 teeth. Shockingly, this one has a five inch pitch diameter and 20 teeth. In other words, that ratio right there is the same for the teeth and the pitch diameter. Everybody with me on that one? So as long as those two point out, it'll be good. Well, you still have to have the right, now there's a pitch diameter and there's a diametrical pitch. We'll get to diametrical pitch in a minute. As long as they have the same diametrical pitch, Yes, the pitch diameter ratio and the teeth ratio are gonna be identical. Now, because they're teeth, you can't have some weird ratio like one to 1 1.665. You know, you have to have teeth that, that, you have to have a whole tooth. You can't have part of a tooth. Now, what is the other, what do the other two lines represent? The top of the tooth and the bottom of the tooth. Now, if I look and zoom right in here, the pitch diameters are always tangent to each other in this drawing, okay? The pitch diameter is partway between the top of the tooth and the bottom. But you'll notice here's the top of the tooth as a phantom line because it doesn't exist. And it comes down here and it does not touch the bottom of the tooth on the other side. Just like what I just showed you. There's a gap between those two. And you draw it that way. Over here, same thing top of the tooth on the little one doesn't touch the bottom of the tooth here. So although they overlap, the teeth themselves don't completely engage. Now, when you draw this, you have to know what size to draw those circles. And you're gonna create models in SOLIDWORKS. How do you do it? You start with a pitch diameter. Now in AutoCAD or in SOLIDWORKS, you could then offset the pitch diameter, something called an addendum, and then you can offset something called a dedendum. You can add to the pitch diameter, and then you can deduct from the pitch diameter to get those two. They are not the same depth, however. The addendum is smaller than the dedendum, and it's smaller by that ratio right there. Now, this is standard spur gears. There are some differences in other parts. There are some other differences, but we're going to assume for the purposes of this assignment, Every dedendum is 1.157 divided by the diametrical pitch, and every addendum is one divided by the diametrical pitch. So far, so good? All right, but you get the, the thing right now is the concept here. We have to figure out a smaller circle and a larger circle that allow the pitch diameters to be tangent, but don't permit the larger circle from hitting the smaller circle on opposite gears. Okay, on that one or not? All right. So where do you get these numbers, these dedendums, these addendums? Well, there are formulas for that. And the formulas for that have to do with the diametrical pitch. So now we're going to look at diametrical pitch. Here we go. <clears throat> there is a gear tooth. And I'm showing you here, I just took a series from a... Um, zoom in a little bit from a, uh, a video that shows you that there's a point of contact and you know there has to be a point of contact because one tooth is literally pushing against another tooth so it's not like that, that we, in my solid work thing i don't even have them touching because i want them to be engaged so i that's a phony thing what i did you know it's not the air that pushes them 
So what happens is this, as this starts to engage, there's one point out near the end that touches. And then that point of contact just kind of rolls along and you can see it is continuously there until it disengages at the end. So that's the involute curve. And when I say varying radiuses, if you think about that string, as you're unwinding it, the string's getting longer and longer. The radius at that point is getting bigger and bigger. And if you kept going, you'd have a spiral. So it's part of a spiral. Actually, that's not a bad way to describe it. I think I've never said that before. That's a good idea. Take a spiral, take a little piece of it. That's a gear tooth. Flip it. That's symmetrical. Connect the two together. You got a gear tooth. Now, the diametrical pitch, I told you, is the number of teeth per inch of pitch diameter. It's a little easier to visualize in a thread because you say, well, that, that thread is this long. So if I measure one inch and count all the threads, that's 20 threads per inch. In metric, you take the thread and you go, what's the distance from one point to another? That's the pitch, how frequently they arrive. Here, you're taking the pitch diameter and you're saying for every one inch of pitch diameter, you have X number of teeth. And in this case, we're looking over here at a four pitch diameter. See that right there? So the four, the over this table right here is for four pitch gear. That means there are four teeth per inch of diametrical pitch. So far, so good. Now, let's take a look at the relationship then. First, the number of teeth per inch has to match or the two gears won't work. You know, they just, they'll clash and they won't even turn very far. They'll just go, eh. <laughs> what are you kidding me? And if you were able to, they would break anyway. So you take a look. Pressure, pressure angle, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with. That's a really difficult concept to get across. I'll just tell you that it used to be 14 and a half was almost always a pressure angle that was used. 20 was an alternative. And now 25 degrees is becoming a kind of a popular um, pressure angle because it does turn out that it can be made quieter. But if you are buying a gear and you look at it, it goes, it's a 14 and a half degree pressure angle. Don't match it up with one that's 20. Because even though it's got the same number of teeth, you're going to have a slightly different shape to the tooth because that pr pressure diameter has to do with where that, what part of that little spiral shows up as the tooth. So we're talking here about a 14 and a half degree pressure angle four pitch gear. So you look over here, these are all four pitch gears and they start at 12 teeth and they go all the way up to 80. That's the total number of teeth. Well, if you look at something here, that's a 12. What's the pitch diameter? That's a three. How many teeth per inch? Four. What's four times three? Everybody with me on this? Twelve. There's a, con as a, a direct, absolute mathematical relationship between the number of teeth, the pitch diameter, and the diametrical pitch. So far, so good? So if you look at any one of these, 20 and five, oh yeah, five times four, 20, right? Four times six, 24. 4 times 7, 28. That means there's no such thing as a 13-tooth four-pitch gear. doesn't exist. So, I mean, it could exist, but it doesn't. Could, could you make a yes, you, you could, but, make it work, but make a you could make a gear that would do it, but you're not going to see it. These are standard gear sizes. Now, gears are either plain, webbed, or spoked. So we're going to say, I'll show you what I'm talking about down here. So right here, um, that is uh, a plain gear is when there's not, no connection between the hub and the teeth. And so if you got a gear that like right here, that's what that is. That's a gear hub. The gear tooth is right at the hub. Mm -hmm. So they don't have a gear with a hub sticking out. You got a gear period. It's tiny, small gear. You come over here, it's big enough. You put spokes in it because otherwise you have a really heavy gear. And so you're going to reduce the amount of weight because you reduce the amount of weight, especially turning weight. I mean, on your, on your bicycle, if you want to really make your bicycle go better, don't worry so much about the frame. Worry about the wheels. Make the wheels lighter, you got a big, big improvement. If you get the wheels lighter by, by half a pound, you're better off than dropping a pound or two off the frame. Um, so big gears have spokes. And then webs are used to connect the hub to the teeth on most gears that are in the middle. And they actually tell you that, and they show you that in the... Yeah, your drawing is going to look like this when you're done. So we're just like, who's drawing that? 
Say what? Where's redrawing that? Well, you're not redrawing that. I'm going to give you different numbers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're going to have to do some calculations. You're going to have to come up with these values up here. But you notice these values up here, I mean, they look like, oh, my, a lot of stuff. Well, you got a diametrical pitch, five teeth per inch. Well, it's exactly the same for all of them. has to be, right? You have the number of teeth. Well, all right. You just pick a number of teeth. This one's 18. This one's 50. That one's 20. That one's 30. I don't know why I didn't label this one. I probably cut it off when I made my slide. It's probably over here someplace. <clears throat> and then, you know, it shows you the pitch diameters. The pitch diameters are going to vary with the number of teeth. Since there are 18 teeth divided by five, the pitch diameter of that is 3.6 inches. So you can calculate that easily for all of these things as you go through. Now then you have, what's the RPM? 1,200 clockwise. You go over here and look at the RPM here. It's a gear ratio. Here's what you have to do logically. You have to say, all right, if I know how fast that one's going, is this one going to go faster or smaller? Because you're just going to divide or multiply, right? You look at a little one, you're going, that's got to go faster. Make sure when you're done, the number you get is bigger. Make sense, folks? This is part of my, the only thing, reason I've survived with my lousy memory for certain things is I would remember how to do things and, and ask myself, does it make any sense? Um, so now, how do you draw those lines? You start by drawing the pitch diameter, and the pitch diameter is going to be based on the number of teeth. It's going to be based on the pitch of the, of the diametrical pitch. And yeah, we're right here. So you go to a table, and, you, and I suppose I tell you that I've got a 20-tooth gear, and I've got a 42-tooth uh, gear, and I want them to be engaged in the same system. And I want you to draw that up for me. You find the 20 tooth gear. You say the pitch diameter is five and you draw a circle that's five inches. Okay. You go to the 42, say the pitch diameter is 10 and a half. You draw a tangent circle to it that has a diameter of 10.5. That's a construction line. Yeah, they're going to be, it's going to be a center line, but you, you, those actually show up as center lines on the drawing. Okay. That's that red line that I showed you, the magenta one. They're tangent. Well, how do you locate them? Where do you want the gears to go? You put the gears where they go and make sure those pitch diameters still touch. So far, so good? Now, the next part, simple. You calculate the addendum. Now, the addendum is 1 divided by the diametrical pitch. In this case, it's 0.25. So, in other words, you take the pitch diameter and you move it out by a quarter of an inch. That's the top of the tooth of each gear. Everybody with me on that? How's the bottom? The bottom is 1.517 divided by the pitch, the diametrical pitch. So it's going to be a bigger number. Um, but all the, everything you need is right there. Now, this also tells you for these gear sizes, what size does the hole have to be? What's the diameter of the hub? And how far does the hub stick out? Okay. A plain steel gear, that's the same as the width of the gear teeth. Down here, <clears throat> the projection of the hub goes beyond the uh, web. So you have a web here, and then the, the uh, hub projects that much out from the web. So in other words, that's the projection without anything like a hub. So in this case, the difference between those two is going to be divided on both sides, and that's how far your hub goes. You get down here, you have the same hub size, but you then go into the spoked area. So plane, webbed, and spoked. So far, so good on all that? Is it really time to take a break? It is. Sam is nodding yes, like, I didn't eat lunch yet, and I want to go get myself a boiled egg, right? Um, and, well, you can boil an egg in about what? How many minutes? Four minutes, so you have time, right? <laughs> all right. All right, listen, let's take a break. When you come back, I'm going to show you how to put all this stuff together into creating an assigned gear system. Ten-minute break. You guys here or not? Everybody with me? All right. Uh, sorry, it took me a couple minutes to get something set up, but I had, I showed you the drawing that I, I mean, the uh, model that I made that's all chained out like this. And this is what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to have you create each of your parts in such a way. Is Ryan here or not? No. Okay. Ryan's going to be this AutoCAD guy. So I'll, I'll deal with him independently. So the, um, so if we take a look at this part right there, 
So how did I create this part? What did I need to know? Well, what I needed to know when I first did it, and this is by the way, so this is a one of those gears that I used, okay? But it's blank. It, I mean, it's not just a blank, but it's you know a gear I used or the, something I drew just to create the drawing. Because what I want for the drawing is to look like this. Um, what I want for the drawing is to have it look like this, where you've got phantom lines, center lines, phantom lines, the center lines touch, and that's the only way to accurately represent this. And in order in SOLIDWORKS to do that, trying to sketch circles on this is a nightmare. So I really needed an actual part. And so I came up with this, and this system works well. Um, what I made is a single part file with multiple configurations. So you notice I got a 32, a 12, an 18, a 30, a 54, and an 84. Those are all based on the number of teeth. Well, where did the sizes come from? If I come up here and I look at the sketch, open it up, that sketch has a pitch diameter of five. It has an addendum and a dedendum. It's got a drawing of the hub itself which is all you know, easily pulled out of the table. So the real question is, how do I get those numbers? Well, five comes from the, pro from the problem. It's five pitch diameter because whatever this assignment is indicated that for that type of tooth, when I looked in the table, the pitch diameter would be five inches. So I drew a line that was five inches. And then I offset that line, one divided by the diametrical pitch. Yeah. One divided by the diametrical pitch is 0.167. The yeah. diametric, yes. Um, no, keep talking. I, I might have a question, but keep talking. Okay. okay. Talk amongst yourselves, right? So but the point I'm making is this. When you make this thing, I put everything in one sketch. You notice that the hub's in one sketch, everything's in one sketch. And then I did a bunch of different boss extrudes. And so to do that, let me do it this way. I'm going to bring this all the way back to here. I started literally with the hub, but the sketch I used had everything in it because it was just easy to do that way. And then I used the contour method to extrude each of these individual pieces. So I'm not, I mean, it's a fake, it's just a whole fake part. What I want is those circular edges representing the hole, the hub, the dedendum, the pitch diameter, and the addendum. So I started by drawing everything in, in a series of concentric circles. And the concentric circle for the pitch diameter is the one that's the key. Now, where did that number come from? That number right there is the result of dividing one by something. No. How about one divided by six? which means that the diametrical pitch for all of these gears is a six pitch gear. Six pitch gear, because if you have how many teeth? 30, this is the 30 tooth gear, five inches times 30, I mean times uh, six is gonna give you 30 for the number of teeth. So to get the addendum, which comes from a table, I'll show you the table and again in a minute, to get the addendum, I divided six into one. That gave me the amount that I wanted to go outside of that. Then I took 1.5. I have to go and remind myself what the actual value is on that. 1.157 is what I hear here. I suspect that is true. 1.157. So I divided 1.157 by 6, and the number I got there was 0.193. That makes sense, folks? Now, this is SOLIDWORKS. All of you have used SOLIDWORKS. You may have forgotten there's an offset command. So if you go to the offset command, pick this, type in that number, offset it the right way, bang, you've got the tooth top, the addendum. Do the same thing the other way. By that number, bang, you've got the bottom of the tooth. That's all you need for the drawing of this. The yeah. hub... Well, you need the hub and the hole and the keyway and all that stuff too. These right here?
See right here? Those are actual dimensions. Yeah, yeah. Because when I did the offset, here's the thing. If I get rid of this. Oh, I never buy CDs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, where did that come from, folks? When I did that offset, instead of just offsetting it and then trying to put a dimension on it after the fact, if I say 0.1, well, 1 divided by 6 is what I'm going to say. I'm going to let SolidWorks do the math on that, right? So that's the dimension offset. I say offset that that much, and it goes out as far as it can. I like what that is. I do that. Now, someplace on here, it's going to add the dimension, which it did down here, okay? So those dimensions are placed when you do the offset. Everybody with me on that one? All yeah, right, now, yeah. yes. Yeah, that number, 1.157 for that equation, is that yeah. true no matter what the pitch of, of yeah. the grid? Yeah, you can assume that that is true. That, that's, that's a conventional spur gear. That's what the d dendum would be. Okay. Okay, and if we look at, um, let's go out of here for a minute. Oh, I know what I'm looking for. The gear chapter. Okay, here's a chapter out of an engineering textbook written by Jensen that at one time I was very fond of. Here, because they, they screwed, I, I, I think I've told you this story. We used it for years. It was getting expensive, though. They um, hired me to do a technical edit on it. Oh, okay. Okay. Thousands of dollars and did nothing, not a single thing that I highlighted, which is why there's errors here but I'm gonna give you one that's been fixed. So if you look here, Joe, this is the table that is used to design gears. And this table is one of those things that was developed over time. So you look up here and it's got terms and symbols and then the math involved. So the pitch diameter is called PD. It's the diameter of an imaginary circle in which the gear tooth is designed. And that's what I showed you. And that's the part that if you had, a, if you had two cylinders with no teeth and you wanted one to drive the other, that's the pitch diameter, right? Pitch diameter is equal to, oh, this is a metric system. Pitch diameter is equal to the number of teeth divided by the diametrical pitch. These formulas are all laid out here. So the, so the dendum is right here. The dendum is the radial distance, blah, 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 blah. And if you look over here, the value that is given is for a 14 and a half or 20 degree pressure angle, the D dendum is 1.157 divided by the DP. For a 20, it's different. So it varies depending on the pressure angle, but we're going to deal with this as though it's a 14 and a half degree angle. Make sense, Joe? Yeah. So anyway, that's where the number came from. And that, that table applies no matter what the diametrical pitch is, because it uses diametrical pitch to generate the D dendum and the, addend the addendum. Now, this is a chapter for your information because it has a lot of detail in here that I'm not going to cover. But I also have this gears handout. And here I've captured all the information that you need for this assignment, including my corrections that they didn't put into the book. And you can imagine, it's a big book. If I'm down there on a table like that with corrections, I, I spent a lot of time on this one. It was very disappointing to me when I got the, my, uh, you know, bench copy or book, you know, they call it desk copy. And I went, great, I can't, what? And then I looked at my, I mean, I had this, yeah, never mind. Here's the thing, you could say. Yeah, it, they called it a, what they call it? They called it the PD. Well, here's the, pro here's the thing that kills me. The earlier edition, none of those mistakes were in this table. They were somehow edited in to the table when they updated the edition. And when they- Someone gave them wrong information. And, they, and somebody changed right information yeah. into wrong information and then sent it to me and I changed it back and then they ignored it. So I didn't complain. I, I did, I mean, I, 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 I bought a significant portion of a truck with that money. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, it's like, I don't know, you get paid to do something, you want to see the results, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, thank you. Here's your thousand dollars for making that cake, but nobody ate it. We threw it away. Can you imagine if you're like, yeah, you make a wedding cake and they pay you for it, but it turns out they threw it away. They didn't like it.
thing. All right. So that's where the information comes from. So pull all your data out of here. Here's the kicker. Things like a negative instead of a positive. <laughs> Same thing down here. Dividing instead of multiplying. It, it was just crazy. This you no, no, they, this book is now out of print. They stopped doing it. I, I think they had their sales on that edition plummeted. I'm sure because it was wrong. Yeah. And so they just don't publish it anymore. Now, down here, this you can ignore, but um, Zach said, how do you actually draw that shape? And the answer is, I don't. <laughs> you, you approximate it. Yeah. Well, if you're going to make a new one, you would still buy the cutter. Here's the thing. I don't care how many, how big it is. The tooth is the same size. So you're going to cut these teeth with the same size cutter. You can have, I mean, I could say I've got a six tooth gear driving a 600 tooth gear. As long as the teeth are exactly the same size, the same diametrical pitch, they'll engage. And you can have this little pinion like spinning away and just slowly, well, if you take a look at them, um, you know, there's a couple bridges in Maine where the whole bridge turns. That's sitting on a turntable with a big, 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 big gear. Okay, so what, are the, what do you need to know? But it says, don't draw teeth. You need to know what is OD. OD is a phantom line. That's the outside diameter. RD, it's a phantom line. That's the root diameter. PD, it's a center line. That's the pitch diameter. Everybody got that? Very simple. Two line types. Phantom for the ends center for the pitch diameter. PDs have to be tangent in a gear train. If, if the gear train is badly designed, it won't work. There's got to be a gap at the bottom. The hole and the keyway are critical because gears are indexed. So there's a reason why every gear has a key in it so that it doesn't slip on the shaft. And <clears throat> the center to center distance you're going to give me at, and that's just going to be the radius of each gear, right? The distance from the center of one out here is that radius, add that to the radius of the next gear, that's the center to center distance. Everybody with me on that? Yes. Is that pitch diameter radius? That's the pitch diameter radius, yeah. So pitch diameter, the radius of each one of, okay, that's Yep, yep, absolutely. In other words, if we look right here, the distance from the center of that out to the pitch diameter is the radius of the pitch diameter. So it's gonna be half of 3.6. Then from here to the center of this is going to be half of its pitch diameter, half of 9.537. You add them together and you know how far it is from here to here. That was the wrong one, but that's not 9.537. Oh, I got the wrong one. How about 10? That sounds better. Okay. All right. So 5 plus 1.8 is going to tell you that the distance from here to here is the sum of those two numbers. That makes sense, everybody? No, that's 1.3. I was going to say, isn't that 1.3? All right. All right. Now, <clears throat> this is a photograph of two gears engaged. And on top of the photograph, I drew what represents them. So you can see right there, that's the root. My hearing aid just stopped working. <laughs> My hearing aid just stopped working. The battery died. Um, that actually is a blessing in this room. It's the wrong side, though. Never mind. So this is the, this is the, the bottom of the tooth. That's the dedendum. This is, this is the top of the next tooth. You can see there's a little gap right there. This actually represents a real gap. Those are your um, pitch diameters. They actually are tangent. Same thing over here. You've got a little gap between them, and that's this gap right here. So I think I've made that point. And then again, Joe, down here is the, is the um, formula you used to do it. Something else here. So when you're done, this is what your drawing is going to look like. Now, how do you get here from SolidWorks? Well, first you have to know what is the diametrical pitch of the system that I'm giving you to do. And to do that, I have to go and close a few things out. Okay, so here's the assignment. And if you open up the assignment itself, it gives you all the information you need right there. Very succinct. It's gonna be a six pitch system. 14.5 pressure angle, and that's significant because that's the 1.157. I want 58 teeth, 28 teeth, 20, 12, and 56. That makes sense, everybody? You're going to prepare cutting data for that as well. We haven't looked at that yet, but we're going to. 
<clears throat> gives you a page number that's out of that book that I gave you the chapter for. And then I'm going to have the RPM of each gear with the first gear being driven at 320. So I'm telling you the, the diametrical pitch, how many teeth, and the speed of the first gear. That's everything you need to know to do the drawing. Also, everything you need to know to calculate all the cutting stuff. All right? Make sense? There are. There's a section in your um, your book on that, and that section in the book is pages 322 to 330. Yeah, that's a shop reference book. I think. I don't think it does. I gave you what I gave you is what you're going to need, and I don't think that that all the stuff I gave you is in the book, but I haven't looked at it this year, so it could be wrong. So I'm going to take this assignment. And I'm going to start doing it right now. And again, six pitch. Let's start with the with. Uh, I'll draw the first two. The first one I'll draw will be the twelve. So it's got twelve teeth. It's a six pitch. So I said it's a six pitch. You notice there's a table for eight. Here's a table for six. I said it's a twelve tooth gear, right? So I got twelve right here. What's the pitch diameter? Two. I know the I know the pitch is six. Diametrical pitch. 2 and 12. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start making that in solid work. I guess I don't really need to have you see that. You'll remember it because you're younger and have better minds than I do. All right. So now we're going to start with a brand new part here. Now this is going to be in inches because everything I'm giving you is in inches. So make sure it's IPS. So we go to do our sketch and I'm going to do the sketch on the front plane. I'm going to draw a circle. And that circle is going to have a pitch diameter of, it tells me, two. So that's two inches right there. That's my pitch diameter. Now, I know that the diametrical pitch is six. That was given. The addendum is one divided by six. So now I'm going to go over here to offset entities. One divided by six. Pick this. Offset it out, bingo, as my addendum. I've got the outside of the teeth. I don't know. What's that? What, what was the answer? Like, what was the I don't know. Well, I use 1.666. I use 1 divided by 6. Oh, okay. okay, so now I go back over here to offset, and I do 1.157 divided by 6. Enter. I grab this. And I say, well, go in the other direction, so I reverse it. Now, that's the key information I need right there. Now, I'm not going to bother to go and put in the hub and everything. Well, why shouldn't I? I am going to put in. The, I'm going to put the hub right here as well, and I'm going to put a hole in here as well. You notice I'm drawing everything in one file. Now, the hub size on this is the hub has a diameter of 1.5, and the hole is 1. So I'm going to put those in as well. Hub, 1.5, and the hole, 1. So you notice this is a very small gear. This is one of those gears where there is no web, right? So the gear tooth comes almost down to where the hub is. So now that I've got all that, I've got to do something with it. And so I'm going to have something as my first extrusion. So it tells me that that hub projection, and I'm not really going to draw this gear from the side, so it doesn't really matter, but it tells me the projection is 0.88. So I'm going to go in to features. I'm going to do an extruded boss. I'm going to make the extruded boss 0.88. It'll be mid-plane because it goes in both directions. And I'm going to do contours and select just those contours right there. Then I'm going to do that, and there's my hub. Everybody with me on this, right? Now, to do the next one, I'm just going to go back up here to Extruded Boss. And instead of doing a new sketch, I'm going to go in and open up the existing sketch. And with the existing sketch, then I can go in. And once again, on the contour, i got to clear what it says in here. Now, I can say, well, the next thing I want to get out of here, I need both of these. I need all these things to, to do something. So I'm going to do that one. Now, it doesn't really matter what I'm doing here, but I'm just going to do something that causes a step so I can see all of them, right? 
This is the only thing I'm doing. So if I just go down to point eight on this, whoop. Yeah, I probably didn't even need to do mid plane, but I did. I do. So you see, all I'm doing is making sure I have an edge there that I can see. Now I go back over here to extrude and I pick that sketch once again. And now clear out sketch from the contours. Look again. And now what I want is this. And this one I want also to be shorter. So I'll just make that 0.7. And once again, I'll do mid plane and then do that. So I don't care what these steps look like. The whole purpose of these steps is that when you're done, you'll be able to see this as though it were drawn looking like that. Are you with me on that one? Now I'm going to go back to this. So, and as long as we're doing it, I'm going to do one more. And the one more is an extruded boss. There's my sketch. What's that? Yeah. We have a question, folks. Go ahead. A addendum goes out. Add gets bigger. D deduct gets smaller. So the D addendum, why wouldn't that just be a physical one? If theoretically that's gonna be there and not get cut. Same with the addendum. Oh, because what would really be there is the end of a tooth, and we're not drawing the tooth. So what we're drawing is representational of the location, which is why it's a phantom line. The question is this: why wouldn't we put an object line out there? You could see it. So you could see the bottom one too. That's what I'm saying. Is why not? They are not visible lines because the actual object is the tooth itself, which we're not drawing. So in lieu of drawing the tooth, we put phantom lines to represent where they would be without drawing the teeth. That's just the convention. So the point here is that once I'm done with this, now what I've got is something where if I look right at it and I say, what's it look like with just lines? That's something that I can now use in a drawing and say, well, make that phantom, make that center, make that phantom, make that an object line, make that an object line, put the keyway in, bang, I've got my drawing. Everybody with me on that? Do keyways? I just got a smart alecky question about how to do a keyway and how do you measure a keyway and that's when you look it up and go from there. So now once we have this, and I'm not gonna put the whole thing together, because you understand that you'll make a tangent relationship, right? Between what the two cylinders representing the pitch diameter, you'll make them tangent, they'll touch. And you want them to line up, just take the planes in the middle and make them all coincident. You won't have any trouble building this system. I don't know what I just heard. I just got a message from my headphone. <laughs> I don't know. Um, the price said talk a little faster so you can get everything done. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to show you when you do the drawing in here what I'm going to give you to help you with the drawing and then what I want you to put into that drawing. I have a template file called gear template that I included on those things you can upload and it looks like this. So that's the drawing that I want you to use because I want you to put the cutting data over here. And that cutting data has one, two, three, four, five columns because you have one, two, three, four, five gears. Yes? You said like two gears are the same, no matter where they are in the drivetrain. If two gears are the same, they have the same RPM no matter what. Okay, so then why is 56 on this plate? And we have two at the moment. Why is that? What? So we have, a, we have two 56 two. Do you? Yes. Okay. All right. And, but if they're the same, I'm just asking. The question is, why did you give me two gears that are the same if they have the same direction? Well, no, I'm just saying, like, why do we have to write it twice on the chart? That's all I'm asking. Do we have to write it twice? Yes, you have to write it twice in the chart. You want to do each one because I'm trying to reinforce the idea that if they're the same number of teeth, they turn at the same speed. And I will tell you, folks, what I get all the time. Somebody does the math, they round everything as they go, and they end up with two different RPMs on those two. That's why you have two at the same speed. So I could then say, when I evaluate it, how can this be? How can this be a half an RPM faster, <laughs> right? So, um, so now, what are you gonna do to bring this in? Open this drawing and...
I got an I don't remember, so let's go make sure we can do it. All right, dummy. So now I come over here and I say, I want to make a new configuration. Let's make them parallel configuration. So I add a configuration. So I have one for 30 teeth, I think. What was the other one? What was the one I gave you twice, 56? 56. So I'm going to call this one 56. I do a 12 already. So the default one. We'll call that 12. All right, so what are we going to do to make changes to them? What you're going to do to make changes is you're going to go to the 56, and you're going to change the dimensions used for it. You know the easiest way to do this, actually, folks? Let's make a configuration table. huh? Remember that? Oh. Double click on Braden does, because he just, he just covered it, didn't we? So I'm going to go in and say, OK, what are the key fig things here? Well, one of the key things is, that dimension right there, well, where are we here? Oh, that dimension right there, there's a hole. So if I double click, whoop, if, I, <laughs> if I right click on that and say, I wanna configure that dimension, it's gonna open up a table. And then while it's opened up, I'm gonna say, I also wanna know this, and I wanna know this, and I wanna know what else do we have, that, and oh here's it's interesting i've got the addendum and the dedendum as long as i change my pitch diameter i don't have to put anything else in here because those are automatically going to result in the right answer right so it's the pitch diameter that matters and in this case what was the pitch diameter was two correct that's that one right there so now um over here for for the under 56 here i'm going to change 56 to the pitch diameter what's 56 divided by six when is fifth nine? Nine. No. Come on, somebody do that math for me. Nine point three, is that right? So I put right here nine point three three three, and then I make sure I save it, give it a name gears maybe save it kind of glad we came up with this now you see what it does now you're probably thinking gee that's no good well we also need the whole size and the hub size so that's going to change as well but is that is that okay yeah that's okay because when we look at it from the front and we do this and we do that we still got all the things we need then you said that add denim and d denim will change we didn't tie them as an equation no, they don't change. They're the same. The addendum and the dedendum are the same for every tooth. So no matter what the pitch diameter is, it's going to be offset that amount from the pitch diameter. Everybody understand that? This is this is actually pretty simple. Now you can do each one of these individually if you want. You'd rather have the practice. But I'm just saying if you could do that. And the configuration table, I think, is the way to do it. Because now all you have to do is go in here and just keep adding new ones here. You do want to change the whole size and the hub size. Other than that, there's nothing else to change to get these. So now we have two different configurations on this. So if I go back to this one, this is a 12, bang, it looks like that. This one's a 58, it looks like that. So far so good? So I'll go back to the drawing. And that's right here. So I've got that in here right now. I did, I stepped ahead of myself on this one. Instead, what I should have done is said, let's make an assembly from the part. And then in the assembly, we'll put that together. So it brings that in. One of them, we could just make, make as our fixed one. That comes in as our fixed one. Now, in this assembly is when we're gonna bring in a new component. And the new component is the same as the old component. We just have to make it like that. And you have to pick it, go over here to properties. I was in the right idea, but. So now we've got that there, you can make those things tangent. And again, what you want to do is make sure that this is tangent to that right there. When you do the tangency, they touch like this, they overlap. That's going to give you what you need for your overlap. Otherwise, control it so they all line up. And then make a drawing out of the entire assembly, and then you can scale the whole assembly. All right? Now, if I remember correctly from key waste, isn't the key way doing something else that has to be put in the configuration? 
registration table and change? You can, yes, you would put the keyway in there as well. When you do that, select the dimension that you need for the keyway. Now, most of these are one, I think, but check and see what it is. Over here, if holes are one, then they get bigger than 1.12 and then 1.25. So yeah, you're gonna and put those right in the configuration table. So. so Braden, there you go. You get to use something you learned in SOLIDWORKS, huh? Kind of amazing. All right, before we go, here's what you have to know next. So you're gonna put that in, you're gonna put some dimensions on there. You're gonna be so thankful you know SOLIDWORKS and not doing this by hand. Um, and then we're gonna go back to this handout. And this handout right here and this page right here, this is what you have to do. All right, so when you're done, you're gonna have a drawing that looks like this. That makes sense to everybody? And so what are you gonna do up here for your cutting data? So here's your cutting data. You can change the size of this if you want. But if, at first it asks you for the number of teeth. Well, you're gonna have 12 on one of them. So you double click in there and you put in a 12 like that. So this is pretty straightforward. The pitch diameter on this, the pitch diameter in this case was 2.00. So that's easy. Diametrical pitch, super easy because you're just gonna type in a six and then the next one's also gonna be a six. So far, so good on that, right? They're all six, right? The diametrical pitches. What's that? The diametrical pitch is the same across the board. It has to be the same, folks. Just think in terms of threads. Pressure angle is the same. 14.5, got to be the same across. The whole depth. Hmm. What is the whole depth? You're going to go look it up in the table. So we go to the table because you're thinking, I'm not sure what the whole depth is, although you'll find in a minute that it's very simple. Isn't that true? So you go back to the table that we just looked at. Okay, okay. So we go back there and you look over here on this table and you go, well, what, what does it even say hold depth? I don't know. Oh, hold depth right there. What is that? The overall height of the tooth. Well, guess what? You know how far down it goes from the pitch diameter and you know how far up it goes from the pitch diameter, right? Yeah. So you put those two numbers together, that gives you a hold depth. Get the idea? No, now you look over here and how does it tell you that? 2.157 divided by dp, which is what you get if you divide one by dp and then divide 1.157 and then you add them together. So far so good folks. The ones you're gonna have a little more difficulty with, when you get down here to something called chordal thickness and chordal addendum. So um, I am, what I'm wanting you to do on this one is to go and get information about something you don't know anything about using references that you know how to use so if you take a look at this, chordal addendum, you say, I don't know what that is. Chordal thickness, I don't know what that is. Circular thickness, I don't know what that is. Working depth, I don't know what that is, right? You look them up in that table, you figure out what it tells you and you apply that information to this, this chart right here. Now, folks at home, everybody with me, does anybody have any questions about what we just did? I got some heads nodding up and down. I got some thumbs up from Ben. And Jordan, you feel like you have a better idea on, on gears than you did? Now, one of the things I told you that we were doing our classes of fit for was, and also the things like keyways, is I want you to be comfortable looking at tables and not going, oh, that's more, I don't know what's going on. That what you have to do in this field or any technical field to be able to use data and use data in whatever form it comes in. And tables are a really co common way for that data to happen. So by doing this, you're gonna to have to also then remind yourself a little bit of how to do math. Mm -hmm. And so some of these numbers are gonna be the same across the board and some of them aren't. For instance, take a wild guess. Is the whole depth the same all the way across? Yeah. It's the same tooth, gotta be the same. Working depth, when you look at it, that sounds like it has to do with the size of the teeth as well. That's also gonna be the same. RPM, you're going to start by saying the RPM is 320, I think I yeah. said, whatever it was on the first one. Then what do you need to know? What's the ratio between the teeth on this one and the teeth on the next one? Divide, find out the ratio, apply that to 320. Make sure that if it's supposed to be faster, it's faster. And if it's supposed to be slower, it's slower. Put the number in. Get the wrong number, flip the way you did. Don't divide and multiply and you'll be all set. Hang on just a second. Folks at home, everybody good on that? All right, I got a question here. Now the RPM is based off of 
the two the gear before, not the first gear, right? Like the two gear that are engaged with each other. So this next one's going to be that one's turning at this speed. The one that it touches turns at what speed? Okay. Everybody with me on that one? Now the next one. The one that this touches turns at one speed. Okay. But they, you can. It doesn't matter how you do it. You can relate them all to the first. Theoretically, it's all right. Not theoretically. You it's can. Same, yeah, everybody understand that? Once I give you that number right there, all these other numbers follow, no matter how you do it. No matter how they are, where they show up in the system, or anything else. Okay. It's based on the number of teeth. And as long as you have one RPM, and you know the number of teeth for that one, everything else is a ratio to that number of teeth. 